So we're making our way through the book of Acts. We're up to chapter 13. And to take a snapshot of where we are, James, the brother of John, is now dead. Herod killed him to please the Jews. Peter is out of prison. He was in prison twice. So Herod sat on his throne. He gave a speech. The people thought he was so wonderful, and he lapped up the praise, and God filled him full of worms, and he died. But God is still on his throne. Herod's eaten up with words, with worms, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Chapter 12 ends on this note. Barnabas, Saul, and Mark all take off for Antioch. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So we're entering into chapter 13, and it's almost as if this could be a second book of the Acts of the Apostles because we're making a big switch from focusing on Jewish people to a transition, Jewish and Gentile people. And we're going to see how that impacts some people, specifically John Mark. So Paul and Barnabas are sent, chapter 13. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. We just read that Barnabas and, and Paul and Mark went to Antioch, but notice that Mark is not listed as one of the teachers, and he's not listed as one of the prophets. So when he's being asked to come along with Paul and Barnabas, he's being asked to minister. He's being asked to be a servant, a helper, whether he's carrying bags or dealing with logistics or whatever it is. But he, at this point, he's not a teacher. Barnabas not a new character in the narrative. We read about Barnabas when he sold a field to give the money. We read about Barnabas when he invited Paul to meet up with the apostles because they were afraid to meet with him. You see, Simeon called Niger, and the contention is that that's the same man that helped Jesus carry his cross. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid him on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. Notice that Luke is the writer, and in Acts 13, he refers to this guy as Simeon, but in Luke's gospel, he refers to him as Simon. You have two different languages going on. You've got the Hebrew and you've got the Greek. Simon as is the name, and we're going to see that as it impacts the question, why did Mark leave Paul and Barnabas? So, you see in Acts 11, where we're going to tie Simeon together with the, the area that he was from. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. You see Lucius of Cyrene, and some folks would try to say that happens to be Luke. Well, Luke at one point does accompany Paul, and you'll notice that when he does, because he turns the pronoun into first person, he says, we went here and we went there. And yet here, when Lucius of Cyrene is there, he's using third person pronouns while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. So my contention is this is a different guy. You see Menaean, which means con consoler, and he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So there's an interesting, interesting in there and an interesting collection of different socioeconomic status. And then, of course, Saul is one of the teachers and prophets. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Fasting, worship, and prayer. After the Gospels, there are only three verses in the rest of the Bible that talk about fasting. And there they are. They're in Acts chapter 13 and chapter 14. We just read chapter 13. And the uh, occasion was when they're commissioning missionaries while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting fasting and worship. Then you jump down to verse three. They were fasting and praying. And then you see uh, chapter 14, a misspelling elders. Uh, again, they were commissioning somebody and they used that opportunity for fasting and praying. So fasting, how not to fast. 
The Bible tells us in Matthew's gospel that if you do things to be seen of men, you've already received your reward. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others but by your father who sees you in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. You see in Isaiah, he says, fasting like yours this day will not make your face to be heard on high. Fasting and prayer are tied together. The right motivation is important. If you're saying, well, I'm fasting because there's the side benefit of losing weight, that's not called fasting, that's called dieting. Some interesting fasts in the Old Testament. David fasted. He had his baby conceived with Bathsheba. And when that baby was born, that baby got sick. And while that baby was still alive, David fasted and prayed as he interceded for that baby. And when the baby finally died, the fasting and the prayer was over. Nehemiah was fasting and praying. He had such a burden for the city of Jerusalem that he wanted to get closer to God. And so he fasted as a way of uh, reminding him, you know, my stomach, if we're in church for more than an hour, my stomach talks to me. It sounds like, whoa. And if it was two hours, it would be a real problem. But Nehemiah was looking for that help. I, I think the most, the, the sweetest fast of the Old Testament was in Esther. When Mordecai said to Esther, the Jews are in trouble. You've got to go talk to your husband and save them. She turned around to Mordecai and say, have the people fast for three days. So they spent a three-day uh, period of time of fasting and praying so that when Esther did her thing, everything would work out. Some other interesting Old Testament fasts. At the death of Saul, and they took the bones of Saul and his, and his sons and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. Scripture never says why they fasted for those seven days. Was it a mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G? They don't have any fasting recorded when Moses died or when Joseph died or when jo Joshua died. So they never really gave a reason. And in fact, Orthodox Jews today pray for the dead. They have a special prayer book and they, they have a prayer called the Kaddish. And it could be verses like this. I know there are verses in 2 Maccabees that try to justify the thing, but I don't know why they're fasting here. Another interesting fast was Ahab. And when Ahab heard the words of Elijah, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went out dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Ahab repented in a real way. I don't know that he was saved. That's I'm not to judge. But he repented. And his reward for that was that the nation of Israel was not going to fall under Ahab. It would fall underneath his children. Ezra, this is an interesting fast. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. So he's asking the people to fast and pray so they could have safety, which is the right thing to do. They're doing it for uh, getting closer to God. But now look, look at the curveball here. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy. You say, our God is going to take us to rebuild Jerusalem. And oh, by the way, my guard not be, might not be strong enough to protect us against the, the, the bandits. And so give me some help. He was ashamed. So we fasted and implored our God for this. And he listened to our entreaty. Paul's first missionary journey. They're going to be commissioned in Antioch. They're going to go first to Cyprus. Now, Cyprus is interesting because that is where Barnabas is from. Also, Mark is the cousin of Barnabas, and may, he may have had his roots there as well. I already said Mark was not a teacher, so maybe he's going to help with the logistics. You know, we talk about going back to my, uh, back to my roots, back to my, my home patch. So Paul's first missionary journey. So 
being sent out by the Holy Spirit. That's the beginning of a successful missionary journey. The beginning of a successful ministry is to be God called, not mommy called or not because it's a great vocation, but being called by the Holy Spirit. So they went down to Seleucia. Now I want you to look at those names, beaten by the waves and wall. And so there are two obstructions right off the bat and they needed to be strong to get past those things. So they went down to the shore to Seleucia. They caught a boat, they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, that was their first test, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John's, they had John to assist them. Now, I already mentioned that Luke used the name Simeon and Simon, and we're also going to see that this one individual, sometimes Luke uses his name John, and sometimes he uses his name Mark, and there's a reason for that. John is his Hebrew name, and Mark is his Roman name, his Latin name, his Gentile name. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they got into hot water. And what you're going to see here is a trend. As we go through these different cities, it's going to be, first of all, sent by the Holy Spirit. They'll reach out to the Jew first. They'll reach out to the Gentile. A certain fraction of each will get saved. And then there'll be a riot. That just seems to be what's happening uh, city after city. In every one of those cities, There, if there's something to be added, it's, a, it's an episode, if you will. So they went to the synagogues first. You see that up above in verse 5. And then they went and they came to a certain magician. Again, the Jew first, a Jewish false prophet named Son of Salvation. Son of Jesus, Bar Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, which means a little net. Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. Here was a small, in terms of power, administrator, but he's going to get caught in the net, Sergius Paulus. It's a success for Paul being called to be the apostle to the Gentiles, but it's the first Gentile, so to speak, that's named as a, as a convert. So to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. But Elymas the magician, that's what Elymas means as a magician, but Elymas opposed him, seeking to turn the consul away from the faith. So again, the trend, Holy Spirit, Jew first, Gentile, and then back again to opposition from the Jews. But Saul, who was also called Paul, Keep in mind, his name went from Saul to Paul, demanding to little, demanding letters from the high priest to go and kill Christians to being a small instrument in the hand of God. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, here's where he's not a whole lot of tact here. Of course, there are times when you shouldn't be using tact. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed, and when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Notice, he was astonished, not so much by that magician being struck blind, but astonished at the teaching. It was the word of God. It was the power of the, the word and the Holy Spirit that brought that man to salvation. Again, the New Testament had not yet been written. And so there had to be the ministry of Jesus Christ validated with signs and wonders. We're going to come back again to that notion of the New Testament had not yet been written when we talk about the, uh, the Jerusalem Council. Now, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. So they left the island, and now they went up to the mainland. And John, Mark's Jewish name, and John left them to return to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. 
but it's not the same Antioch. And they'll, Luke will differentiate. He refers to Antioch in, Sy in Syria and Antioch in Pisidia. And so Paul and Barnabas go inland and they go up to Antioch and Pisidia. John, John Mark, goes to the next port over there and then he leaves and goes back to Jerusalem. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Keep in mind, he was launched from Antioch, but he went back to Jerusalem. And that's where we first met him. Remember, Peter was in prison and he was released and he went on over to the house of Mary, who was the mother of Mark. He went back home. I don't think he went home because he was homesick. So, John Mark, first cousin of Barnabas. Is that why Barnabas invited him to come along? We don't know. Is that why Barnabas wanted to give him a second chance? Keep in mind, keep in mind the name so Barnabas means son of encouragement. But he was his cousin. He was possibly wealthy. Now, we know that Barnabas had wealth because he sold a field and he gave the money to the apostles. The hypothesis is that he grew up in Cyprus. He became orphaned when his dad died because his mother owned the house in Jerusalem. They were devout Jews. And so the, the, the suggestion is that the reason John Mark left Paul and Barnabas was he was offended that Paul was evangelizing Gentiles. And we're going to see that becoming a bigger problem, and that's what permeates into the Jewish, the, the Jerusalem council. Mark's mother owned a large house. And we see that in Acts 12, 12. Where did Peter go when he was left out of prison? Went to that house where there was a large group of people praying for him. Possibly saved through Peter's ministry. Now, Peter refers to Mark as his son in the faith. Possibly identify with younger people. Maybe they brought this, this guy along because he could communicate with the younger people. We don't know. Possibly. Now what, why, did, why did he quit? And here's the, the suggestion, because Paul was evangelizing to the Gentiles. And all this writings, remember I said his name is going to be switched by, uh, by Luke. He's going to be referred to John in this Jewish contention time. And then he's going to be referred by Mark when he becomes a missionary on the second round. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had John to assist them there. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Paul was not a happy camper. When it was time for Paul and Barnabas to start on their next missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take Mark. Paul said, nothing doing. So Paul and Silas went on that second missionary journey, and Barnabas and Mark went back to Cyprus. And some days, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. Why? We already asked those questions. I, I'm, my contention is that Mark had a change of heart in regards to evangelizing to Gentiles. And you got to ask yourself the question, well, what changed his mind? What happened between the time he left Paul and Barnabas to the time where Barnabas wants him to, to go take another tour? So we have to take a look at the sequence of events. First of all, in Cyprus, Mark is offended that, the, that Paul evangelized to the Gentiles. In Perga, Mark catches the next ship to Jerusalem. In fact, he had to go to the next town to do it. In Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas come down to the Jerusalem council. And we're going to be studying that shortly. Why was there a Jerusalem council? Because there were some folks that went from Jerusalem up to Antioch and were trying to teach that if a Gentile is to be saved, he has to become a Jew first. There was a certain degree of prejudice there. And we know that prejudice goes all the way back to in Luke's gospel, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. There was a prejudice there with the, the Samaritans and certainly a prejudice there against the Gentiles. In fact, they referred to them as dogs. So Mark is offended. 
Mark goes to Jerusalem. Mark is with people, some of which are saying, you got to be uh, Jewish first. Peter testifies of his experience with Cornelius. Mark accepts Gentiles as potential brothers in Christ. Mark returns with Paul and Barnabas after the council. Back to Antioch and Syria, and that's where Paul, Barnabas, and Mark are staged to go on that next missionary journey. But Paul is not ready to accept Mark as a missionary. In the end, Paul changes his mind. 2 Timothy 4 is the last thing that Paul wrote. He said, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. So getting back to Turkey, getting back to the mainland. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, where they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement, say it. Keep in mind, Barnabas is son of encouragement. Brothers, fellow Jews, if you've got a word of encouragement, let's hear it. So Paul starts the same thing that Peter did on the day of Pentecost. He recites some, uh, some Israel history. The same thing that Stephen did before his stoning. He recites some Jewish history. And so here's Paul doing the same thing. He goes through a series of Jewish history and then comes down in verse 23, down to Jesus. So what is the ultimate encouragement to a Jewish audience? The Jewish people had spent 2,000 years, back to Abraham, 2,000 years waiting for the promise. There was the promise of people as many as the sands of the sea. There was a promise of real estate, the land. And then there was a promise, and they didn't get that into it too big, where the many nations will be blessed. They sort of had that one a little bit out of focus, but the first two were very important to them. So what Paul is saying is the coming of Jesus is a fulfilled promise. I talked about the Adam promise, uh, the Abraham promise. It's also an Adam promise, but the Jewish people, they didn't, didn't very often in their con conversation go back to Adam. It was always Moses and Abraham. The ultimate encouragement, first of all, a fulfillment of the promise, but second of all, forgiveness of sins. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Fulfilled promise, forgiveness of sins, and freedom. Jesus said, if the Son of Man shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. He said, I came that you not only have life, but that you have it more abundantly. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Now, we spent a lot of time studying the book of Leviticus. And we went through the different sacrifices. We came down to the sin sacrifice and the trespass sacrifice. And then we talked about David. And David, between his adultery and his murder, there was no sacrifice for that. There was no uh, forgiveness. It was a stoning situation. And what, the, what Paul was telling him is Jesus is coming to seek and to save that which is lost. And there's no sin that he can't forgive. There's no scoundrel so bad that he can't save. And as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told on the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas. There were Jews by birth and Jews by believing. They're Hellenists. They were proselytes. Both flavors came after him. They followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So there you see on the next Sabbath, Almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. How sweet would it be if in our nation, the majority of every town got together to hear God's word. God's word was going out in so much power. There was so much Holy Spirit uh, filling. 
that it was it was just electrifying. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas, they were not wimps, just like with Elymas. It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy to eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. John's first chapter says, he came unto his own and his own received him not. So verse 37, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. And we come again, but the Jews, but the Jews, the Jews incited the devout women and the leading men. So, they knew how to get under people's skin. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook the, off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. Now, this is going to be really interesting because the area of Iconium is the, is the location of where they're moving through Iconium and they go to Lystra and to Derby. And when we look at the miles that these troublemakers had to cover, it's going to be interesting. It's 60 miles from Antioch and Pisidia to Lystra, where they we're, we're going to read that they stoned Paul. And it's 19 miles from Iconia to Lystra. But what I think is really interesting is the next day, Paul goes to Derby, which is a 50-mile hike the day after being left for dead. Truly a miracle. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. That brings us to chapter 14. Paul's first missionary journey. We're traveling along. We've seen them leave Antioch. They sailed, went through Cyprus. They went into what is now Turkey, up to Antioch, driven down to Iconia. And we're going to see Iconium is going to push them into Ly Lystra and then into Derby. Now, at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue, the trend that we see all the time until we hit the Macedonian vision. Uh, and then he's going to move primarily, if not exclusively, to the Gentiles. Now, at Iconia, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time. It wasn't like they said, oh, we better get out of this down too. They, with, they withstood that opposition until it starts really bubbling up. They spoke boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders. Again, a validation because the Bible had not yet been completed. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derby. So they think they're getting out of trouble. They think they were getting away from the stoning and watch the trouble follows them. Job said, as soon as sure as sparks fly upward, man is born to trouble. And Paul and Barnabas are personifications of that. They, were, they fled to Lystra and Derby and there they continued to preach the gospel. And what happens there? They meet a crippled man. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. Just like the situation that we see with Paul and John in Acts chapter 3. Again, another picture of the sinner who cannot help himself. He listened to Paul speaking. This is the crippled man. The crippled man listened to Paul speaking and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made, made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. 
That truly is a miracle. If I was injured, I could do physical therapy and over time I would start walking again. But this guy had never walked before and he springs up and begins to walk. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying in Laos, Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Now I want you to see in the next few verses how quickly these people's minds get changed. They're going to go from, we want to sacrifice to these people, to, okay, they're just normal guys just like us, to, let's stone them over a, a very short period of time. The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd crying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed nations to walk in their own ways. Now, this is an interesting verse because the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. Hebrews chapter 6 tells us that God cannot lie and he cannot change. He's immutable. So the, all of the Bible has to be true and all of the times. So when they say the, he allowed the nations to walk in their own ways, what he's saying there when we tie that together, together with Romans 1, which we're about to see, is those people were accountable for what they did know. So here we are 2,000 years later. I don't know how many copies of the Bible are around. I've got bunches of them at my house. My guess is you have multiples at your house. We're accountable for what we know. We're accountable for what we should know, given the opportunities that we have. But look at, in past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. Well, who was the witness? For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, intelligent design, if you will, the invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. You look at a sunset. You look at a, a, we have we, we did have blossoming cherry trees. The blossoms are gone. The, the leaves are out right now. Man can't do that. God did that for you and for me. So they are without excuse. Even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. Now, here comes the turn of events, right? Paul goes from the stoner to the stony. He was the stoner. He was holding the garments as they stoned Stephen. And now he's the, if you will, the stony. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. They went way out of their way to make trouble. And the Jews came from Antioch and Iconia, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Well, that raises the question, was he dead? They supposed he was dead, but was he dead? My contention is yes. We read here in 2 Corinthians, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. Well, what revelations did he have? If he wrote the book of Hebrews, he was the largest author of the New Testament. If he did not write the book of Hebrews, he was the second most prolific author behind Luke. So he had great revelations in that way, but we're going to see a specific revelation that occurred on this particular occasion. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Is this one of those revelations that we're going to take a look at? It? I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. He was caught up to the throne room of God. 
whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. He was caught up. He had some form of body. He didn't know what it was. Don't know if he was allowed to talk about it. There were certain things that he heard that he wasn't allowed to repeat, but he had quite the revelation there. Can you imagine how it would change one's life if they got a real peek into heaven? I had an opportunity one time to go to Israel and it changed the way I thought. It changed the way I teach. But can you imagine if I had a peek into heaven? Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Now, he was told in 2 Corinthians 12 that if he, if he was going to boast on anything, he was to boast in the Lord. He could have said, I was caught up into heaven, but he didn't. He said, I know a man. And I think it was on this particular occasion. Was he dead? Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto his unto us by his spirit for the spirit searches all things yea the deep things of god you see kjv in red i'm going to pause here and tell you something i believe i'm entering into dementia bible verses that i could rattle off can't come to me i can remember phrases and so how did i memorize scripture in the first place I was saved when I was 28 years old. I had no exposure to scripture. I went and I got three by five index cards with the reference on one side and the verse on the other. And that's how I memorized scripture. And I'm going back to the three by five cards to somehow either maintain that memory or to re-memorize those things. I wish I had kept those cards. So when you see a verse that's KJV here, it's because I'm trying to reinforce what either is in my mind or was in my mind. Back to class. He rose up and entered the city, and on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derby. He took a 50-mile hike after being left for dead. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconia and to Antioch. Talk about boldness. We read about their boldness on several occasions. He's going right back to the location where he was stoned. He's going right back to the, where the perpetrator started the whole thing and visiting those people who did believe. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. I want you to notice as we go through this reading, and we're also going through the book of Joshua on Sundays, how many times the need for encouragement is there? How many times more so than Joshua, you tell uh, God is telling him, be of good courage, be not dismayed, be strengthened. And if Joshua needed that, and if these disciples need that, and if you read the epistles to Timothy, Timothy needed that. We need that too. So as we read through these things, you see words like encouragement. Just remember, everybody needs some. So we should be dishing out just like Barnabas did. Encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So now they're returning and completing that first missionary journey. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia, that region where Perga is. They went down to Italia, just like Mark. That must have been the port where the, the scheduled ships were coming from. And from there, they sailed to Antioch. They sailed to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. They went back and reported to the church that, that commissioned them. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So now you see Paul and Barnabas, Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, they go, they take a lap through, through Turkey, they're coming back and they're sharing the things that God had done for them. 
what we're going to see is somebody from Jerusalem comes to Antioch and gives the exact opposite. And so Paul and Barnabas, they're going to go down to Jerusalem and once again, play back all the things that we just read through, all the people that got saved, both Jew, key point, and Gentile. And they remained no little time with the disciples. So we don't know how long they were there, but they had plenty of time to rehearse, to repeat the things that happened to them in that journey. So I want to talk a bit about Timothy. Timothy means honored or valuable, valuable to God. Was he converted by Paul? The reason I'm talking about Timothy at this point is Timothy is from Lystra. And we just talked about the stoning at Lystra. We read in Acts, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there. Where? Derby or Lystra? My contention is Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy. We read in 1 Corinthians, I urge you then be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. It's that kind of verbiage, and you see it there several times, my child in 1 Timothy, my beloved child in 2 Timothy, where one might say that Paul led Timothy to the Lord. On the other hand, we're going to read right there in Acts 16.1 that a disciple was there. doesn't say anything about whether Paul knew him beforehand or not. Was he a native of Derby or Lystra? Again, we have that same verse. We look at Acts 20. Paul decided to return through Macedonia. Supiter, the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy. If Timothy were from Derby, it would have said, and Gaius and Timothy of Derby. But he, there's a big comma there, and there's Timothy. Did Timothy see Paul get stoned? He's from Lystra. I don't know how big Lystra was. There was a big hubbub there because they went from wanting to sacrifice them to stoning them. And we read in 2 Timothy, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Timothy saw Paul get stoned. Is that what saved him? We don't know. The Bible talks about his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice. Was he saved under their uh, teaching? We don't know. Did Lois and Eunice, were they saved before Paul got there? We don't know. But we do know this. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And they had the Old Testament. Paul may have very well have come into their life and put the icing on the cake. Connect the dots, if you will. The Old Testament says this, and Jesus fulfills all that stuff. Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council. I'm going to read through it and then we'll comment. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the apostles, came down from Judea to Antioch. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small detention, dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So that's the question. There are two things that the Jerusalem council dealt with. The first one was, does a Gentile have to become a Jew before they become a Christian? And the second question was, once they become a Christian, how do they live their daily lives? And why were the stipulations given to them that were placed in that council? So Paul and Barnabas tried their best to solve the problem in Antioch. It couldn't be solved, so they're going to send it down to the apostles, down to Jerusalem to figure the thing out. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, 
describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. So they didn't just go to Antioch and say what they did throughout all of Turkey. They're coming and they're passing down from Syria through Phoenicia, through Samaria to Judea. And along the way, they're sharing again that same great news. The good news isn't just that Jesus saves and you get saved on the spot. The good news is that Jesus has been saving people because it is an encouragement. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, you think the Pharisees just made trouble for Jesus? The Pharisees continued making trouble. Keep in mind, Paul said that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He probably knew all these guys on a firsthand basis. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. It's a tough thing to let go. Today, we don't call Pharisees Pharisees. We call them legalists. Whoever wrote Hebrews said a mouthful right here. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. He's talking about all the rubrics that the, um, an observant Jew goes through. And what he's saying there is, let's move on to deeper things. Get away from the, the, the trappings. That's an interesting word in this context. Let's get away from the trappings of the Talmud and get into grace. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, the debate started in Antioch. They couldn't solve the problem. Then they come down into Jerusalem, and there's still a great debate. And Paul is saying, look, I've experienced all this stuff throughout Asia Minor, and now Peter's going to jump up. Peter stood up and said to them, brothers... You know that in the early days, God made a choice among you, that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Keep in mind what Peter is talking about was Cornelius up in Caesarea. He was down in Joppa. Cornelius sent some servants and a soldier down, brought Joppa and some witnesses back up to Caesarea. And when they were up there, they received the Holy Spirit. And there was a speaking in tongues to prove to those Jewish witnesses that came that it really, really happened. That's the purpose, that's the first purpose of, of tongues. So Peter's now reciting this again. He says, they made no distinction between Jew versus Gentile. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Nobody could keep the law. And so Peter is saying, why should we want to put pressure on those people? We can't handle the stuff ourselves. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as the Gentiles will. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Again, no scripture, so the signs and the wonders are there for validation. And after they finished speaking, James, the brother of Jesus, James, the brother of John, is dead. And after they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. Simeon, Jewish rendering, Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. And we'll get into the word shortly. But I want you to notice that he says pro prophets, plural, but he's only quoting one of them. And he is not saying fulfilled because there's more to what Amos has to say. We're going to read from Amos shortly. But there are also many, many other prophecies that deal with this Gentile situation. So he quotes from Amos, after this, I will return. Well, Christ had not yet returned yet. This is a, this is a, a passage that deals with New Testament times, 
And it's a passage that deals with the second coming. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. Excuse me. Well, the tent of David hasn't been rebuilt yet. And in fact, the city of David, just a few years after this, is going to get wiped out by the Romans. After this, I will return. And I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Keep in mind, these are the guys that heard Jesus say firsthand, and if I go away, I will come again. They're the same guys that heard the angels say, men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing? He will return in like manner. These guys, they were thinking he's going to come back any moment. And we should be thinking the exact same way. He's going to be coming back any moment. And what they're saying is he's taken from Amos. And Amos is saying, when Jesus comes back, he's going to be coming back for Jews and Gentiles. So James is going to say, why should we have a problem with that now? Jesus isn't going to have a problem with it then. And so to James' point of multiple prophets, there are all the different prophecies that deal with Gentiles to be saved without becoming Jews. So that solved the doctrinal issue. Can a Gentile become saved without becoming a Jew? And now they're asking the second question. Okay, a Gentile can become saved. How does he live in harmony with a Jew? That's what they're trying to answer now. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled, and from blood. And if you stop there, you've got to ask yourself the question, why are they asking those Gentiles to do those things? We're not expected to do those things now. I mean, we, we still have to avoid sexual immorality, but we're not worried about diets. We're not worried about worshiping to idols. The answer is this. The book of Acts is a transitional book. And all those folks that have been saved are sitting in the synagogue. And they're sitting in the synagogue. You see this next verse 21. And what are they hearing from the synagogue? They're hearing some applicable things like from isaiah but they're also hearing some mosaic law that's no longer applicable so here's the jew and here's the gentile and the question becomes is that gentile going to be an offense is that gentile going to create a a distance between himself and his brother because on the one hand they're still being fed from the old testament and they don't have the new testament yet it's a transitional book and that's what it was the 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 uh, the regulation for then and there, not here and now. Not that these things were wrong, but we just read with a notable exception, sexual immorality. Not that these things were wrong, but how do they affect other people? And it comes back to the question. Well, first of all, you could boil all this stuff down to one phrase: live for Jesus. Putting it in other words, in just one word holiness separated from the world separated to god how do i conduct myself and how does my behavior affect other people but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak when i was saved i'll say it in the positive because i never cured of this thing i'm an alcoholic and I have led a number of alcoholics to the Lord. Now, if they see me drinking any kind of an alcoholic beverage, I think those guys could be offended. So I have complete abstinence for several reasons. First of all, I still have that bent. Second of all, for me, I want to live closer to the Lord. 
And third of all, I don't want to be an offense to other people. And that's what's the behind all of this. They're afraid that those Gentiles that have a liberty are going to live in such a way that they would be a stumbling block to those people who all their lives, and then again, every Saturday, hear something different. First Peter says this, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. I've gotten several business cards from folks where they have that fish on the business card. Well, it's one thing to dedicate your business to the Lord. It's something else to hide behind the Lord. It's all about motivation. It's all about why are we doing the things that we do? So I want to borrow from John MacArthur, and he, he uses lots of words. There was a pastor down in Nottingham Baptist Church. He made it very, very short and sweet. His, his fr phrase was, if you doubt it, don't. Well, here's MacArthur, and he's got several points. Excess. Do I need this thing? You know, need versus want. God will supply all your needs. The Bible doesn't say God will supply all your wants. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. I have earthly assets, and everybody in here does as well. Is that earthly asset a weight that drags me down from my purpose for God? Is it something that's in excess? Second point he brings up is expedience. Is it useful? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Is it helpful? Is it expedient? Does it build me up? Does it build up the church? Does it give encouragement to the next guy? Or is it an offense? What would Jesus do? If Jesus was at my house, and we're watching television, and something off color comes up, what would Jesus do? You say, well, he wouldn't be watching television in the first place. That's of the devil. No, we're not going there. Okay. What would Jesus do? Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus walked. Paul said, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. What would Jesus do? And then evangelism. If I do this, is it going to enhance my testimony or is it going to detract from my testimony? The book of Colossians says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Am I doing things that are going to further the cause of kingdom? Am I doing things that would stall the cause of the kingdom? Am I doing things that would actually detract from the cause of the kingdom? Moving from Acts to the Epistles is moving from transition, uh, is a transition to doctrine. Therefore, if food makes you makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. What Paul is saying is he will do whatever it takes to see people get saved. We read in 1 Corinthians, what there I go with King James. Whatsoever you drink, whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Paul, this is an interesting phrase we just read, he tries to please everyone. The challenge is, to try to please every with everyone without taking away from trying to please God. That's the tightrope. On the other hand, God richly provides us with everything to enjoy. He gives us everything, and we're to enjoy it. But do we put limits on ourselves, and why? And this went through MacArthur's four reasons why we want to live in ourselves. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. That goes all the way back to Augustine. And it's been quoted by several guys. At one point, we had a tapestry in this church where that was embroidered into the tapestry. I think it's now up in the uh, 
Lancaster historical uh, same same building that's got the the tabernacle up there. But Augustine was quoted was credited with first coming up with that. There's an interesting name, Rupertus Meldinius. He was a contemporary of Martin Luther, and he tried to use that phrase to bring Lutherans and Catholics together on the doctrine of transubstantiation. And Luther said, there's, there's no compromise on that one. There's, there's just a big problem there. And so that was the dent in Meldinius' armor. The council's letter to Gentile believers. Keep in mind, Paul and Barnabas tried to solve the problem in Antioch, didn't work. Paul and Barnabas came down Jerusalem, and it took a whole lot of dialogue with Peter jumping in before it finally got figured out. And so now what they're going to do is they're going to send an envoy back up to Antioch where the problem started to solve the issues. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers. They sent a Jew and they sent a Gentile because they're going to send this letter. And then on top of the letter, they want the Jewish guy to talk to the Jewish people. And they want the Gentile guy to talk to the Gentile people to say, this is the way it's going to be. And it didn't, it didn't happen easily. They sent them with the following letter. The brothers both the apostles and the elders, to the church who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions. This is similar to Paul writing to the, to the Galatians and saying, I heard that, you, that you're dealing with a different kind of a gospel. What they're saying is, yeah, there's some guys that came down from Jerusalem to did, that, that said these things, but that's not the way it is. Verse 25, and it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul are there, but the real messengers, the real go-betweens are the Jew and the Gentile, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus. We have therefore sent Judas... Barsabbas, and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. Did they send them because one could speak Hebrew fairly well and the other one could send, speak Greek, maybe Latin? Did they send them because culturally one's Jewish and culturally one's Gentile? He sent them because they are like, you know, we have used the phrase birds of a feather flock together. They're trying to convince the Jews that it's okay. They're trying to convince the Gentiles that it's okay. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. And they rattle off those same requirements. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. They didn't just say, read the letter, and now let's have a song and enjoy. They continued and continued to strengthen and to encourage. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. Now, that Mark name is coming back again. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with them and they sailed away to Cyprus where they both were natives of. Barnabas took Mark. They went to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas. Silas means woods. And when they left Antioch, they didn't go by way of the water. They went overland. The little guy, Paul, and the woodsman, Silas, departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches.
We have seven minutes. 